We are recording. Well, I'm going to do a test clip. Because I want to make sure. Now, 10 minutes in, I'm actually recording. It's not our fault. Um, I know. Um, okay, so as the screen says, welcome back. <laughs> For spring, uh, this is MAP 606, partial differential equations. And uh, so most of you were in MAP 605, um, but those of you who weren't, that's okay because the prerequisite for this class is only MAP 285, uh, the differential equations. Um, so, especially for benefit of you who are not in 605, they're basically going to run the class in the same, exactly the same manner. Um, and uh, so, uh, we don't have tests here, we just have homework assignments, one for uh, each chapter. Um, and we're going to cover the first uh, eight chapters in the textbook that's listed on the uh, syllabus. Now, I was able to find the textbook for free online as a PDF. So, so did we. Yes. Yeah. So, you share? That's what you do. Okay. I'm going to try this again. Apparently, all that was lost. Um, and the thing is, apparently, it just says import is aborted due to drop frames, and there's nothing you can do about it. So, <laughs> this is going to be scary. Um, so, I'm going to have to keep an eye on this um, and maybe stop it every so often. Okay. So, uh, so I, did, does everyone have a textbook? As a PDF. Working on it. Okay. <laughs> if, you have, if you have trouble, just let me know and I'll send it to you. Um, okay. Uh, and I'll be pulling the problems from a book. And actually, this book has the answers uh, for the uh, odd number problems. Oh, so, yeah. There, isn't there a solution manual or something? I don't know. I don't know about that one. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm not just, supposed to share that information. <laughs> yeah, you, you can just keep that to yourself. No, no, it um, has. Like the odd number one, right? Yeah. Um, also, all odd number one? Well, the solution manual might have everything, uh, but, but the, the textbook itself has the odd numbers. Oh, no, this is the one for my other PD class. Never mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, that one has a little more. Then that one has the solution manual. I'm sorry. Oh, that could have been useful two years ago. Um, okay. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, and that's what, like it is, 605, um, if you go to the website for the course that's listed in the syllabus, you can find all the information there as usual. Um, including notes. Uh, so I've posted notes for today, um, uh, and they're reasonably complete. Uh, but it's really, it's really meant to be the notes for all of Chapter 1, which I'm covering today and Monday. Um, and I'm still kind of working on the stuff that I'll be covering on Monday. Um, so the, the notes are kind of a living document here. Um, but I'm, I'm largely I'm following the book uh, fairly closely. Also, I taught the other PDE class, uh, Math 417, 517, a couple of years ago, and there's a fair amount of overlap in the material. It's kind of covered in a different order. Um, so I'm actually piggybacking off of my notes uh, for that, too. Um, okay, so now that everyone is welcome back. I guess a few of you have taken 417, um, and uh, they might be a distinct advantage. Um, okay. All right, so far this recording seems to be going smoothly, and hopefully that continues. All right, now. Um, This is what this course is all about, partial differential equations, which I'll simply abbreviate as uh, PDEs. Um, so uh, let's recall ordinary differential equations, or ODEs, um, So these depend on, these are equations that depend on derivatives of a single variable function. So there's only one independent variable at play here. Um, okay. 
Uh, so for example, the equations that you saw were like y prime is equal to uh, say y squared uh, or y double prime minus 3y prime plus um, Y is equal to zero. Uh, so these are examples of ordinary uh, differential equations. Um, now, a, a PDE, by contrast, um, the solution is a um, function of several variables. When you have a function of several variables, you would take partial derivatives with respect to these uh, variables. So the equation itself involves partial derivatives. Um, usually, these several variables refer to like several spatial dimensions, so x, y, or x, y, z and also time uh, t. Um, so all, all of these variables are uh, normally what's involved. That's what makes it a partial differential equation. But, uh, so by this time you would have learned about solving ordinary differential equations, and that knowledge is gonna help because often the way we solve PDEs is by decomposing them into um, ODEs for the different uh, independent variables in question. Okay. Um, now, <coughs> now, you write like the most general form of a PDE. Um, and we, we don't use this form very often, but it's, it's helpful for, at least for, for a theoretical point of view for analyzing PDEs in general. Where you have, it is, you have some function, uh, big F, that depends on all of your independent variables. So you could have like x, y, uh, well, I'll just have any number of variables, x1, x2, up to xn. So these are your independent variables. And then you have your solution. So most of the time, I refer to you as a solution, whereas in ODEs, it's customary to refer to the solution using a lot of y. Um, okay. And then... The equation also depends on your partial derivatives of u, like your first partial derivatives. Um, and keep in mind, often subscripts are used to indicate partial derivatives. You would have seen this, for instance, in multivariable calculus. So when I say like u sub x refers to partial derivative of u with respect to x, or uyz is the second partial of u with respect to y and z, um, just for notational uh, convenience. So we have our independent variables, our solution, our first partial derivatives, and then second partial derivatives, like ux1, x1, ux1, x2, and so on. However many partial derivatives you need, up to whatever order, so you might have third, fourth order partial derivatives too, all equal to zero. Okay, so uh, say some arbitrary function f that involves all of these um, equal to zero. That describes your uh, PDE. Um, well, in many cases, we might not necessarily need all these variables, but um, so this is, a, um, again, covering all the bases here. Okay, so I want to mention um, a few... Um, particularly well-known PDEs, ones that come up in any first course on PDEs, and we'll certainly spend um, 
more time talking about. So hopefully we don't have to worry about the recording anymore. The trouble is, like, this semester we have more people depending on this recording than last semester. Um, okay. okay so these are um, most often mentioned uh, PDEs. So I guess these are ones that would have the most followers on Twitter. Um, <laughs> We should create a Twitter account. For Only Haley. <laughs> Only Haley would think that's funny. Um, okay, you got a point there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing at Haley. <laughs> I know. Yeah. The Navier Stokes equation. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm glad I don't have Twitter now. <laughs> <laughs> so that I can't be Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
partial view with respect to P is equal to the Laplace. Now, often the heat equation actually has some sort of coefficients, which may actually be functions of x, y, or z. Uh, but this uh, is boiled under the simplest form, where it's just, we, we often it can be transformed into this, uh, where it's just du dt equals uh, Laplace. And you might also have some other terms here that represent like, um, like an external source, for instance. And later, we'll derive a heat equation uh, with that um, included. OK. Um, so in this case, U refers to temperature. So given the uh, initial temperature profile, um, what, how does that temperature profile change over time? Um, and physically, what you expect to happen is, regardless of whatever heat sources you might have or whatever the current temperature profile is, over time, uh, the temperature will become uniform, it'll smooth out to some ambient temperature. Um, so solutions to the heat equation tend to be quite smooth. You, do, you tend not to have these abrupt jumps in temperature and time. Okay, and then um, third equation is the wave equation. And that's uh, similar appearance, but having a second order time derivative uh, changes the behavior of a solution completely. Um, so U in this case is a displacement. For, for instance, if you're only in one space dimension, uh, wave equation could model a vibrating string. And uh, so U represents the vertical displacement of a vibrating string from uh, equilibrium. Um, so, um, so this is useful for modeling wave propagation. Uh, for instance, in uh, two dimensions, it could be modeling like ripples in a pond, for example. Um, uh, so you know, sound waves, water waves, any kind of waves can be modeled using equations such as this. Um, and uh, you have very different physical phenomena because everything's traveling with a finite speed. Um, whereas in the heat equation, you have this virtually instantaneous uh, diffusion um, that happens. Um, so, okay, for example, um, when, it, when you're, uh, these kind of equations um, that have a finite speed of propagation are useful for modeling traffic flow. Um, and you find it annoying when you are uh, stopped at a red light, there are several cars back, light turns green, and supposedly, you know, everybody should start moving, but it takes a long time for you, several cars back, to get moving. It's because of um, this finite speed of propagation that happens in these kinds of systems, that, that like, uh, such as traffic flow. Uh, whereas if it functioned more like a diffusive system, everybody could get going right away. Uh, but physically, that would, that's just not possible. OK. Um, now, um, So a couple basic questions I want to put out there. How do we arrive at PDEs in the first place? Uh, we're trying to model some sort of physical phenomenon. How do we know that the equation that we're trying to solve is the right one that would conform to uh, what we'd expect uh, physically? And the uh, reason uh, that these PDEs are valid is they generally come from physical laws, such as law of mass conservation or conservation of momentum or, uh, or energy conservation. Um, so we take these physical laws often, that are often expressed in words and we uh, describe them in a more quantitative fashion and then often perform some sort of manipulations, you know, typically involving calculus, um, in order to, uh, that uh, introduces derivatives into the picture um, and then come up with a PDE um, from that. Uh, but there are some PDEs that uh, do not come from physical situations. For example, financial mathematics, um, uh, modeling of prices of uh, options. Um, uh, but those are similar kind of PDEs as to what I described here. In fact, like they use uh, diffusion, for example. So um, uh, some uh, 
um, random phenomenon can be mo uh, modeled using stochastic PDEs. Not something I'm going to get to in this course, um, but uh, those are also extremely uh, useful. Okay. Um, so uh, if your unknown u represents uh, position, then of course your first derivatives represent velocity, your second derivatives represent acceleration, and, and so forth. So all these derivatives, have their physical meaning uh, comes into play. Okay. Um, now, what we'll be preoccupied with for much of the semester, <coughs> solving them, of course. Well, sometimes we can't solve them. And if we can't solve them, we at least want to understand something about the behavior of our solutions. Um, and there's uh, various techniques, uh, many of which we'll see in this class. Um, so uh, one of the simplest, but only useful in certain situations, is separation of variables. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, taking a PDE and breaking it down into multiple ODEs that can easily be solved. Um, um, integral transforms. In your first differential equations class, you may have seen the Laplace transform. Uh, another one is a Fourier transform, a Hankel transform. There's all kinds of different transforms uh, that are meant to um, make a PDE that depends on a certain number of variables depend on one less variable. So you can actually do multiple transforms to get rid of all the variables that you um, a bit, a bit is a way to convert a differential equation to an algebraic equation. So, so this breaks the part of PDE into ODE. That's what separation of variables does. Integral transform reduces PDE eventually to algebraic equations. Or at least it can make certain variables algebraic. Um, okay. Uh, one of my favorite techniques. Uh, eigenfunction expansions. So there, you're expressing the solution as a linear combination of certain known functions um, <coughs> that can help. Uh, so then you're solving for these coefficients, the so use of j here. So maybe you can um, come up with uh, simpler equations for those coefficients uh, that are your only unknowns. Um, and the methods I deal with most often, because uh, these methods, other ones might necessarily be practical, are numerical methods. I don't really get into much in this course, unfortunately, but I certainly do in my other classes. Um, and these are for PDEs that cannot be solved analytically. So you try to find approximate solutions. Um, so, for instance, there's finite difference methods, finite element methods, spectral methods, which is my research, um, and so on. Um, now, uh, while the other types of practical solutions, numerical methods tend to be useful for a much wider variety of PDEs than any of these other methods that can produce exact solutions. So, for instance, Navier Stokes equations, which I'll talk about either later today or Monday. Um, is one of the most important uh, PDEs. Um, forget about trying to solve exactly. It's not going to happen. But uh, you have to approach it numerically. Whereas these equations right here, the Laplace equation, heat equation, wave equation, in certain situations, we can solve them analytically using techniques such as these. OK. Um. Just to make sure nothing goes wrong, I'm going to temporarily. And now we've resumed. Okay. Now, those of you who were just sitting in my other class, you're going to get a sense of deja vu here. Um, okay. um, I figure review never hurts. Um, so one very important concept of PDEs, well for many mathematical problems, but 
Please come up for PDEs in particular. Is that a well posedness? Um, so we'd like to make sure that before we try to solve a problem that's described in the form of a PDE, that it actually can be solved, uh, that the problem itself actually makes sense. Um, otherwise, it's kind of a waste. Um, and uh, mathematician Hadamard um, formulated the, he really, really formalized the um, notion of uh, well posedness. He described three conditions that a, a problem should satisfy in order to be considered uh, well posed. Um, so, first, the solution has to exist. I know it's like the duh thing, but this is a not trivial task in PDEs. So like one of my colleagues has often written papers about here's a PDE. Does the solution actually exist? Um, and a lot of times, without actually solving the PDE, it can be proven that a solution does, in fact, exist. Uh, well, in 605, last semester, we did this for certain ODEs. Um, and not only did we prove the solution existed, we also proved this, that the solution is unique. And so uniqueness is very important to um, establish. And uh, what we'll see with, with PDEs is a PDE by itself doesn't generally does not have a unique solution. We have to impose certain side conditions, like um, initial conditions, boundary conditions, um, and that makes it uh, unique. Um, and another very important condition um, is the solution depends continuously on the uh, data. So, um, so that's a formal statement. The in informally, um, what I mean is, um, and you make a small change in whatever problem data you have, like your initial data, or maybe any coefficients that you have. That should cause only a small change in the solution. Um, you don't have a situation where um, the problem changes a tiny bit and the solution is thrown off by a lot. Um, now, um, uh, okay, so I'll write this down. And, and for the uniqueness, you need these side conditions. Okay. Um, now, Fortunately, I can easily give you an example of uh, ill post problem. Well, I'll, I'll do a contrast. Um, two problems are very similar in appearance, but one is well posed and one is ill posed. Okay. A well posed problem is one of the ones I was talking about earlier the heat equation. So the UDT is equal to the Laplacian. Now, all I have to do is make a small change to this problem and make it um, ill-posed. Then the UDT is equal to minus Laplacian. Um, and this is called the backward heat equation. OK. Um, so and because it's basically what happens if you are trying to solve the heat equation going backwards in time. Because um, with the original heat equation, you're given an initial temperature profile, and you want to see what happens to that temperature profile over time using the laws of diffusion. But in the ill-pulse problem, you have the same initial temperature profile, and you, see, you want to see where it came from uh, by, by going back in time. Now, why would this be ill-posed? Um, because you could think of it as, suppose you solve the heat equation. You have a solution, like a formula. All you have to do is change T to minus T, and you get a solution to um, the backward heat equation. So here we have existence and uniqueness. So you have existence and uniqueness for this, too. So what's the problem? The third condition. 
um, depending continuously on the data. Um, and the reason for that is with uh, diffusion of heat energy, um, you have your temperature profile that's smoothing out over time, uh, so you have exponential decay um, as T increases. What's the opposite of exponential decay going backwards in time? Growth. Exponential growth. So what that means is the tiniest change in the initial temperature profile, uh, like the initial condition for this problem, is going to lead to um, an exponential change, exponentially growing change in the solution. Um, so, um, so, so normally we deal with problems where we don't have exponential growth. Uh, we're looking at exponential decay or maybe um, magnitude staying the same over time, like with wave propagation. You have a, you have a string that is able to vibrate forever, for instance. Um, so uh, so that's just to illustrate that how the third condition um, often can be the, the gotcha one. Okay. Uh, in fact, one of the equations I work with for uh, image processing is known to be ill-posed um, due to this uh, third condition. But strangely, numerical solution seems to work out anyway, so people still use it. <coughs> Until 4:45. Okay. Um, what? I said technically. What do you mean technically? <laughs> I'm, I'm just a dummy. That is so not happening today. I, that's all. I, I didn't. I didn't say that. <laughs> you said that. I think she meant like you can take uh, like longer. No, no, we yeah. have class after. We have that's class right. after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Um, now, there are certain terms of importance we're using quite often, so I want to put those out there for how we classify different kinds of PD. Um, so, for instance, uh, the order of a uh, PDE uh, is the yes, yeah, the order of the high, whatever it's the highest derivative you have. Now, most of the PDEs that we'll deal with are either going to be first order or second order. Um, so, for instance, first order, something like du dt plus du dx equals zero. Uh, the three equations I gave earlier, uh, Laplace's heat wave, those are all second order equations. So here we have ut is equal to Laplacian of u. Here is the first derivative, but the Laplacian has all second derivatives. Uh, so that's a second order equation. Um, one interesting equation um, that's a fourth order, ut is equal to uh, ux, x, x, x. Um, this is the beam equation. Um, so you're, you have a beam um, and you have some load imposed on it. How do, uh, so U refers to the displacement of the beam over time. Hopefully that displacement is very small, but you want to be sure um, because that, that load is going to have an effect. Um, generally the higher the order of equation, the more difficult it is to solve numerically because uh, those Higher derivatives mean a lot of growth in certain functions like uh, exponentials. Okay. Um, but, and now I talk about the number of variables in a PDE. That refers to independent variables. So, how many spatial dimensions do we have? Um, is uh, time included? So, for instance, um, if I have a uh, heat equation, u dt is equal to uh, uxx plus uyy. So, this is three variables. Um, your solution depends on x, y, and t. So, it's that number of variables that we're interested in. Okay. Um, all right, another very important distinction among PDEs. 
is the PDE linear or not? Um, so this comes from the fact that is uh, the function big F that the, the most from a most general form of the PDE is it a linear function of all of its variables, including your independent variables and your dependent variables and the derivatives? Now, all of the examples I've given so far, heat equation, wave equation, Poisson, those are, um, oh good, my first class uploaded. Um, all of those are examples of linear uh, PDE. So, uh, so for instance, uh, du dt equals Poisson is u. Uh, Nonlinear, um, du dt, actually a slight change of this equation, du dt plus u times du dx equals zero. So here we have two of the variables from your most general PDE form multiplied together. So that causes non-linearity. This is a well-known equation called Berger's equation. Uh, what we'll definitely come to uh, actually pretty soon when we study first order problems. Um, OK, so um, I guess another. Uh, Nonlinear one would be okay. Here's a change in the heat equation. So plus u plus u. At this point, it's still linear, but as soon as I subtract off u cubed, um, that is a nonlinear equation. This is called the Allen Kahn, not Star Trek Kahn, um, mm. equation. Um, okay, one of our four PhD students who just left us, um, Alex. Um, uh, that was one of his uh, test problems. Okay, because uh, he was developing a time-stepping method for solving nonlinear uh, PDE. Okay. Um, another uh, descriptive term for PDE deals with is coefficients. Are they constant or variable? A lot of PDEs that are studied in classes like this one have constant coefficients because it makes homework problems nice, or relatively nice. Uh, so a constant uh, coefficient would be like du dt is equal to k um, uxx. So this is a one-dimensional heat equation where k is a constant. Um, and that, that, in this case, the heat equation that constant refers to the thermal conductivity of the uh, medium in which you're measuring the temperature. Um, a variable coefficient problem would be a slight change in this. Du dt is equal to um, du d, d dx of a constant, uh, sorry, not, a non constant coefficient, a of x times du dx. Okay. Um, so derivative of all of this. Um, so if A was a constant, I could pull it out and I have A uxx again. Um, okay, well, at least I know you're familiar with this. <laughs> so, um, and uh, so in this case, we have a coefficient. This is still a linear PDE um, because A of x has nothing to do with a solution U, but it's a variable coefficient problem. Um, now, my research is mainly about linear variable coefficient problems, but I do get into nonlinear on occasion. Um, because constant coefficient ones, of course, are so much easier to solve. But if you're talking about linear PDE, whether the PDE is constant or variable coefficient, the behavior of solutions is not much different. Um, and it makes me think that there ought to be easier ways to solve variable coefficient problems. Um, and while I've made some progress over the years, so looking to make more. Okay. Um, now, um, okay, I have some other ways of uh, classifying these. If it says u dx, you could have just written down u of x, right? Yeah, I could have. Um, I have some 
normal classifications. Um, if we're focusing just on linear equations, and particularly ones of second order, Uh, so I'm going to write a, set, a general second order equation in two variables um, in this form. And B U X Y plus C U Y Y plus D U X plus B U Y plus F U, that's important, um, equals G. So we have some coefficients, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then I'll get uh, Derivatives of order 0, 1, or 2 uh, of uh, u. Okay, now, um, so the classification is the equation is called hyperbolic. We just sure remember this. Yeah. This okay. is the easiest homework. What's the condition? It's uh, if the determinant is uh, less than 0. B squared minus 4ac is less than 0. Then parabolic, if it's equal to 0, and no wait, it's greater than 0. Greater than 0. And yes. then parabolic is equal to 0, and elliptic is less than 0. zero. This is like, what? No, this is. Okay. And the this thing is, the um, <laughs> if you have a PDE that is hyperbolic, um, the actual behavior of a solution has nothing to do with a higher parabola whatsoever. The names just come from a fact of, uh, you just look at an equation, a x squared plus b x y plus c y squared equals zero. Uh, well, actually, you still have the upper terms in here. Uh, plus b x plus b y plus f. Um, if you look at something like that, an equation like this, if, if b squared minus 4ac is positive, that describes a hyperbola. If it's equal to 0, it describes a parabola. If it, um, it's negative, it describes an ellipse. Um, so that, that's where the names come from. So it's just something that's uh, easy to associate with. Um, now, um, some of the PDEs I've just been talking about fall into these classifications. Um, the wave equation is an example of a hyperbolic equation. Uh, the heat equation is parabolic. The Laplace's equation is uh, elliptic. Um, hyperbolic equations tend to have this finite speed of propagation of, of, of data um, as time uh, advances. So this, there's no time in here, but um, you can think of the y variable referring to time, uh, um, and, and it classification works. Um, parabolic equations, you tend to have infinite speed of propagation, like instantaneous diffusion, which doesn't really happen physically, but it's virtually that quick. Um, Laplace equation doesn't really feature propagation of any kind at all, at finite or infinite speed. Uh, this is something that's more like a steady state uh, phenomenon. Okay. Um, now, this is for two variables. If you have more than two variables, um, then uh, the definition does generalize in a natural way, but that's more than your algebra that I want to get into uh, right now. Uh, but basically, you'd have a matrix of these uh, coefficients of your second order derivative terms, and uh, if you're looking at the matrix being like, for instance, positive definite, it'd be hyperbolic, or negative definite, uh, it'd be elliptic, and so forth. Um, okay. Um, Now, um, next, I need to talk about, whoops, there you go, splitting chunk again, um, different kinds of solutions uh, to PDEs. So it has to be not invertible to be parabolic? Oh, um, the determinant. oh um, 
I don't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. That, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. So different kinds of solutions. Strong versus weak solutions. Now, even though this is about PDEs, for, uh, to illustrate, um, I'm going to uh, use an ODE um, just for convenience. Um, so, I'm supposed to have an equation uh, u double prime is equal to um, some function f. Um, so, function. Uh, and then I'll impose boundary conditions. Uh, so this is on the interval 0 to 1. And I'll impose boundary conditions u0 and u1 are both equal to 0. Um, um, so u is a strong solution, also known as a classical solution. If essentially if it satisfies the PDE on its entire uh, domain. In other words, you can go ahead and actually substitute your solution into uh, the uh, equation um, and it actually is satisfied. So as an example, u double prime is equal to um, let's say uh, Sine of uh, 2 pi x. Um, oh, also has to satisfy any size conditions. Um, so, um, and the same boundary conditions here. So, u of x, um, a solution that would work would be minus sine of 2 pi x over 2 pi squared. Um, because if you plug in x equals 0 or x equals 1, you're going to get 0. So, it satisfies the boundary conditions. And if I take a second derivative uh, of this, uh, then it actually will give you sine 2 pi x for all x um, in a domain. Now, um, the thing is sometimes the PDE and the um, boundary conditions, or side conditions, might be incompatible with one another. Uh, for example, what if I chose <coughs> f, this f, to be a function that doesn't satisfy the boundary conditions, then there's no way I could have a strong solution in that case. So it's not as easy to have a strong solution as you might think. Um, so like, for instance, okay, um, a uh, weak solution might be something like this. So my equation is u double prime is equal to, let's say, uh, uh, x. And uh, I still have the same boundary conditions. Uh, u supposed to be equal at uh, 0 and 1. Um, so, um, okay. Well, actually, in this case, hmm. yeah, this is not a good example because what I can do is I can integrate x twice. And uh, come up with a um, uh, I tell two arbitrary constants that I can use to satisfy boundary conditions. So actually, sorry, that's what I get for coming with things on the fly. I'm not going to be able to come up with a good example based on that. Um, okay. Um, now, um, if a PDE is of order m, so it's of order, so no, like m is equal to 2 in this case. Um, a strong solution um, has to belong to this function space, which I call C sub m of d, where d is the domain of a PDE. And C sub 
cm of d is um, space of all n times continuously differentiable functions. on your domain D. Um, and if there's no superscript there, we're just looking at continuous functions. Uh, but you need to be able to compute all those derivatives and have it satisfy uh, the differential equation. Um, so we're looking for solutions in a certain uh, function space. Um, okay. <coughs> now, I actually have a very different example involving the same differential equation where I can um, explain what a unique solution would be like. And what I mentioned earlier about having incompatible side conditions, so that is problem that really does happen where um, you can't satisfy all aspects of a, of a problem. Uh, sometimes they just don't match up. But I want to show you a different example where a weak solution can come about. zero at the boundaries. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take both sides of this differential equation and multiply them by function b of x and b of x is a, what's called, called a test function and I'm going to require it to satisfy the same boundary conditions. Must be equal to zero at the endpoints. Okay, now I'm going to integrate both sides from zero to one. Okay. Um, next, I'm going to apply integration by parts to the left integral. So this is my u, this is my dv. A faster way to understand integration by parts, you can think of it as I'm taking a differentiation operator and moving it from one function to, to the other. Um, so taking one of these derivatives and shifting it over to here, what does that give me? A sign change. Um, so integration by parts here is going to give me v of x, u prime of x, with limit of 0 and 1, minus uh, v prime, u prime, and the right side stays the same. Okay. Now, I've required that u, that v, be equal to zero at the endpoints. So this whole term goes away. So what I'm left with is minus integral of v prime, u prime, equals, oh, there should be f, not u. Okay. Um, so, a, so what I have here is the weak form of the ODE. And a weak solution satisfies this equation for all v that satisfies the boundary conditions. So in other words, for all possible test functions. So if you can find a function u that satisfies this, that would be a weak solution. And the reason why it's a weak solution, not a strong solution, is I'm only requiring u to be in C1 of 0, 1. Because do you see a second derivative in here anywhere? No, you don't. Um, 
So now v, the test functions have to have a first derivative um, because of this. Um, so you can have a function that doesn't even have a second derivative, but it can be a weak solution to a second order ODE. Uh, so a lot of numerical methods are based on a weak form such as this. Um, uh, be because the re requirements for smoothness are uh, relaxed. Can you, uh, can you repeat that last part? Like, why is there a weak solution? Because you only need to be uh, one times, like, can be in C1. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really what makes it weak. Um, so you might have a function that is in C1 that would satisfy this. There's no way it can be a classical solution because it doesn't even have a second derivative to plug right, in. Right, right. Makes sense, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not going to get as far as I wanted, but I think it'll be all right. Um, a few more definitions to give that will keep coming up. Okay. Um, actually, the homework problems for this chapter are not very involved. Um, so uh, you might actually be able to jump into them right away. <laughs> At least, certainly some of them. Well, also, I assigned five problems and four of them are odd. <laughs> so I guess I was particularly gentle for this chapter. That doesn't mean I will be on the other chapters, but we'll see. We're willing to make a bet again. What? We're willing to make bets again. Okay. We've already discussed it. Gotcha. Yeah. And I caught my leg on the table yesterday, so. You what? I caught my leg on the table yesterday, so. Oh, okay. You should take that. Okay. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, all right. Um, Tom? We'll be working at security. All right, so. Whatever it takes. It's often media describe DEs in terms of, or ODEs or PDEs in terms of Differential operators, and I often uh, use this notation. So, so call it, this is from linear algebra, really. linear transformation it is just any function, call it L, that goes from a vector space V to another vector space W. So these are vector spaces, which could be in our case, function spaces, and it has to satisfy basic conditions for linearity. So L of x plus y is equal to L of x plus L of y. L of a constant times x is equal to a constant times L of x. So you can pull constant factors out. And this has to be true for all x, y in your domain vector space, v. Um, but um, if V equals W, so the domain range of the same vector space, uh, the terminology is L is a linear operator on V. Um, okay, now the kind of operators that we're interested in is. Um, So L, often using its uh, operand in square brackets, is a differential operator if it um, performs basically these two operations and is a linear operator. Uh, differentiation of U. And also, multiplication by coefficients. Okay. So those are the things, and of course, addition. Um, so those are the, um, uh, what's allowed. So for example, suppose I have a heat equation. U dt is equal to, um, and I'll actually throw in a coefficient here. 
um, dx of a of x du dx plus um, some source term uh, big F of xt. Um, so I can define L applied to U as this part of the spatial derivatives. So this is a variable coefficient but linear differential operator. Um, so that allows me to describe the heat equation as UT is equal to L U plus big F. Um, so it's a way to more concisely describe a PDE, is to express uh, certain portions of a PDE, if not the whole thing, uh, as some sort of linear differential operator. And again, for uh, the linear part is, is very important here. Um, okay. Um, now, um, some uh, terms. If you have a PDE of this form, LU is equal to zero, that is called a homogeneous uh, uh, PDE. Um, and when, when you have a homogeneous PDE, the function U is equal to zero is a solution. Um, and if you have something non-zero, so like LU is equal to F, but it's non-zero, that is inhomogeneous. Okay. Uh, so that's an important distinction because certain things you can do with homogeneous PDEs you can't do with inhomogeneous ones. Um, okay. Make sure that's uh, so it's supposed to be not equal to zero. Okay. Um, now, one. Um, Four minutes. Okay, that's just enough. Well, I got through sections one point one through one point three. I was supposed to get to one point four, but I guess I'll have to wait till Monday. First day, already behind. Does it say in homogeneous? Yeah, in homogeneous, or it could be called non-homogeneous. Either one. Okay. Alright. Um, so the last thing I want to cover today is the, the principle of superposition. This says that if U1 and U2 are solutions of a linear homogeneous PDE, then any linear combination uh, of these two solutions is a solution because L of this linear combination, L is a linear operator. So what that means is you can separate the terms and pull out the constants in each of those terms. So you end up really just applying um, L to just U1 and U2. But U1 and U2 are solutions of this homogeneous PDE. So those are zero, so the whole thing is zero. So that's uh, um, so this is something we use um, quite often in the solution of homogeneous PDE, such as for instance wave equation or heat equation. If we can find uh, a family of solutions, then any linear combination of them is a solution. We find the right linear combination. So these constants are chosen in order to satisfy side conditions. I will get into side conditions more on um, Monday. As for instance, initial conditions or boundary conditions. Um, so uh, that way, um, if we find a family of solutions, then these are our last remaining unknowns in order to satisfy everything that we need to. Um, 
Okay, so at least I've gotten to the end of section 1.3. So you go ahead and start looking at the homework. Um, because a lot of them are like plugging in certain functions into uh, a PDE and basically performing algebraic tasks. Uh, so just basically going your way around a certain uh, simple PDE, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Uh, definitely nothing cool like some of our problems from last semester. I can promise you that. I don't know if we can access it yet, but well, like, is it due this month? It's due February first. Okay. First. That's on yeah. Monday. We'll, well, it's still about this month, so yeah, I'm not super so, late. Yeah, it'll be fine. That's two weeks. Okay. It's better than next.